for part three, and once again, we're here with Bobby Lopez, and we're talking now about tech stuff, man. I like this. This is a really <laughs> interesting. I mean, even for a guy just sitting in the fan, uh, in the fan, <laughs> sitting in the stands, I'll get it out. It's interesting to kind of know about some of the stuff that's going on in the pit area and in racing in general. At the beginning of the season, uh, boy, there was really a big deal about raised frame rails. <laughs> and, I mean, uh, it was all over everywhere, and I think that has kind of settled in, hasn't it? Yeah, I think it's kind of went to the backdrop. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, there's more issues than just the frame the frame rails being pied and raised up. And as, as far as me being a tech guy, I haven't seen but maybe a few cars that way. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of guys call me about it because they had cars built from – well-known builder saying do i need to change this well i'll go on record by saying the rules it pretty much every track has been the same no altering the frames right and if you cut a chunk of the frame out and you kick the frame rail up that's altering the frame okay if you move this or you move that or if you're trying to move your cross members or shorten them up that's pretty much altering the frame right um, last year when this all came about I got sitting down and started thinking about it. Well, I started coming up with tools, and I got guys that's got CNC machines and stuff like that, and I started making the tools just to check mm -hmm. cross-member setback, uh, lower control arm stuff, where everything goes in if it don't fit on it. I mean, I've got them for different cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot more than just the race frame deal. I mean, I probably, out of both tracks last year, I had maybe two cars. Mm -hmm. Um and it's such an easy thing to see, especially on a modified. When they drive by, you'll see that frame rail kicked up. Mm -hmm. But there's a kicker to that, too. These guys are all animals. They all get banging and beating and stuff. And a frame rail is a frame rail. They bend up. They do what they do. So when you see something like that, you got to go determine whether that was caused by a wreck. Right. Or was that caused by a human? And so it could have been a race adjustment. <laughs> yeah, and I, and, and I even I even got the phone calls last year about guys putting it back, and they said, well, if I put it back, I'm altering the frame. Uh, I think that's what I ask you. <laughs> well, well te technically, you're not altering the frame. Mm -hmm. If I go out and wreck my truck today, and I bent my frame, and I pull it back, I'm putting it back to where it was. So you're Spence. not, you're not altering the frame. You're putting it back to where it needs to right. be. Uh, okay. M my question about uh, chassis is... Uh, and some of this, and I'm going to mention Gary Clark. I don't. I hope he won't mind. But I think when I was down there and talked to him, and we were talking about the raised frame, raised frame rails, uh, one of his statements was, "Is I think a lot of the tech guys out there need to be checking a lot of the other stuff on the front ends, and maybe centering in more on that than actually the frame rail, because to him the frame rail wasn't that important, but." Are there things on the suspension in the front end of A mods that I, I, can be altered? Yeah, there's I, there's a lot of things you can do. Coming from my background, being in the body shop business, and me being a frame guy, um, it doesn't take that much to put a car up on a on a frame machine, or even put it up on an alignment machine, and start playing with mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, most most race cars nowadays they put, they build lead in the cars. I can put a lead in the car with a frame machine. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I started coming up with the tools to check side-to-side -side measurements. Um, we started checking lower lower control arm mounts mm -hmm. to cross-member mounts and stuff like that. Yeah, I do it more frequently than sometimes I feel like we should. But, you know, if I'm doing something and I do it twice a month, at least I feel good about it to know I'm checking something. Right. And I don't know about any of the other racetracks. I know the stuff that I got we use at Lakeside, and we also use at CMS. But we 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 actually do quite a bit of checking on frames. Okay. Let's move on. How about fuel? Ah, fuel. Do we have? Are we having many problems with fuel? Well, in the 2008, 2009, 2010, and now we're going to 2000. Yeah, 2010. With the E85 coming out, and then now we got E95 coming into the mix, it started making uh, some fuel testing a little bit difficult because mm -hmm. your guys that run the pump gas, it, it came up 
pretty awkward. And guys racing race fuel instead of the 85 started coming up awkward. Mm -hmm. And when I, you say awkward, give me a little. Well, just to say. To say fuel, fuel's got a fuel's got a Pacific gravity to it, or it's got a point number, and the tools that we have, it pretty much tells you all that. So, when you start getting to that, and then all of a sudden you're getting numbers that are just really weird, mm -hmm. you gotta gotta start looking into it. Because when you get 10, 12 different cars, mm -hmm. something's wrong. It's not just a fuel; it's something else. As far as having fuel issues, I don't think so. I don't think it's as big as the issue as what people think. Now, I, I have had my suspicions about certain drivers, uh -huh. not naming names, but I've, I've had some pretty su good suspicion about different drivers doing some different things. Okay. All right. Uh, in short, what is the biggest area that a crew or racer, and I'm going to use this word creative thinking, use creative thinking <laughs> to get that little advantage over fellow competitors? I'm gonna have to, I'm I'm gonna have to put that in a two-part deal. I think the first one's gonna be engines. Um, a one guy that I like real well, yeah, he's good at finding gray areas. Uh -huh. uh, the other part about that suspension, and that other that guy, you know who I'm talking about, and I think the world of him, but he's good at finding gray areas. Uh -huh. And I found out in the last four or five years that these racers are really good at finding gray areas. Uh -huh. If we could take out every gray area out of a rule, we would have a book, probably uh -huh. 300 pages long. Uh -huh. But it just don't work that way. Yeah. One of the best comments in a set of rules that's out there, it says, if it's not in the rules, don't do it. Okay. That pretty well describes it. But it still don't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that almost leads me in, actually, and this is, I'm not going to pose this as the last question, but was going to be my last question. If a race car driver or a crew member, if they have any doubt about a rule, should he call and talk to someone before he spends a lot of money and goes out and does something because he thinks the rule reads a certain way, and then later on he finds out that it's illegal? Well, I could be a smart aleck and say it depends on how much money that guy's got. But, no, I, you know, when I started at CMS and Valley, I've always had pretty much an open deal where I put my cell phone number out there, I put my home phone number out there, and trust me, it's cost me a lot of money. Right. But I've always been open to all the racers. I don't care if they're from Iowa or wherever. If you don't think that something's going to be wrong, uh -huh. call me. I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. I can't always be 100%. I mean, this is one of those deals. I mean, I know what the rules say. Uh -huh. What they dictate by the rules sometimes is a whole different whole right. different story. I was going to say, what they read and how they're read, notice the words read and read <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> are a lot different. I, I, have to, I have to say, when you're set down and you're doing a set of rules and I have to look at the BMOD rules, you know exactly what those rules are supposed to be. And these guys sure do come up with some... It's like there should be an extra paragraph underneath some of this stuff sometimes. Uh -huh. And over the years, you know, they, they, you've seen changes in the rules, but some of the, you know, like BMOD rules have changed just to try to clarify certain things that's went on. Right. So. No, there was a big gray area in heads. There again, we won't mention any. Well, it's like I said, you know, it, at first I didn't think I was wrong because I knew the way it was supposed to be done. Uh -huh. We'd talked about it in driver's meeting. But if it's not written down in them papers... I, I, I'm a firm believer, and I believe is now, them guys are going to take every advantage of that if it's not written down in there. Right. I was going to say, it, it's got to be spelled out in black and white and forward and reverse because, like you say, if somebody can use some creative thinking, yeah, they will take that and figure out a way to uh, work around it. Uh, Bobby, we've got 45 seconds left, and the last question I want to ask you is, in your opinion, what is the purpose of a tech crew at a given racetrack? I'll make it short and sweet. I believe the purpose of a tech crew at any racetrack is to try to keep the competition on an even playing field. Amen. Is it easy to do? No, it's not, because it's actually a tough task. I mean, I, I thought racing was a second job to me, but I'm going to tell you what, this this tech and stuff is yeah. even worse. The only thing is you don't have to get out there in the car and get banged around. 
<laughs> oh, I, I'd much rather be in a race car. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we've got to wrap up part three. Bobby, this has been totally interesting, and I'm sure everybody out there is going to find it the same way. Thanks a lot. Oh, I appreciate it.